Hey folks, welcome. This is Bob Tripathi with Digital Sparks Marketing. And what I like to do is I like to talk to industry leaders. And today I have a great industry leader, Stephanie. Welcome. Thank you. Stephanie Cox is with Lumavate, and Lumavate is a very interesting SaaS company. So. Stephanie, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Stephanie Cox. I am the VP of Sales and Marketing at Limovate. I have more than 15 years in digital marketing experience. I've worked for brands such as Salesforce, Ingersoll Rand, Project Lead the Way, and others. Nice, nice. So I know right now you're with Lumavate. Yeah. So I know, can you tell what you guys do at Lumavate? Yeah, so we are a platform for building progressive web apps. So if you've not heard of PWAs, they're really the next gen of what's happening in mobile and the web. They bring all the native mobile functionality to the web and allow you to develop once and have it work the same across iOS, Android, and web. Nice. Um, I know that is a big discussion and people ask this question a lot to yeah. me, is should they build the app or should they build a progressive web app, which is a PWA? Yes, PWAs all the way. Um, and part of the reason is, if you think back to when the App Store launched, there was a lot of great functionality right. that existed, and that was really impo impossible to do on the web. But today, there's been so many improvements from brands like Google, Apple, Microsoft, on bringing the web browser forward that it really enable you to have the same app-like experience mm -hmm. using a PWA. The other thing it allows you to do is you can develop it once and still have it work on iOS and Android, exactly right. the same, right. which is something that you can't do with native mobile. Right. So your ability to drive faster de development, um, more efficient cost, yeah. but then my favorite is increased adoption and engagement. Nice. So one thing that people don't realize about PWAs is that you don't get them from the App Store. Right. You can actually get them from URLs, QR codes, text, really anywhere you stick a CTA can now be a PWA activation point, which means that you're actually getting that whole app on your phone mm -hmm. within a matter of seconds. So you have great experience that you yeah. can build it with a PWA, but then the other thing is you can actually bypass the whole App Store, Google Play Store. Yes. And I think that's getting to be a big issue where people have to fetch out a lot of, fork out a lot of money to these Google Apps. Is this one of the reasons why people are going in the PWA route too? It is, and part of the thing is around being able to control your own publishing. Right. So this idea of, if it's my app, do I really own it? And what a lot of people don't realize is actually the App Store could remove it at any time. Right. They don't have to allow you to continue to exist, but with the PWA, you can publish it, make mm -hmm. changes as many times as you want, and you don't need anyone to review or approve it. Right. Right. The other thing that's a big benefit to it is that it allows you to kind of actually own it. So thinking back a couple months ago, a lot of people heard in the news that Facebook wasn't necessarily making great decisions with their developer credentials yeah. on the Apple App Store. Yeah. So Apple revoked those credentials, right. which actually stopped a lot of their internal apps from functioning. So they apps they were using to run their business stopped working for two, almost two business days. Right, right. And that's a great example of why we need to own our own stuff. Yeah, and I heard the story too that Mark Zuckerberg got so pissed off, if I may say so, that he changed everyone's phone to some Android phone. Yep. I don't know if that's true. But I've heard similar stories, so yeah. right? So when you talk about PWAs, I think one of the biggest things that people have is they can go on an app store and there's a higher adoption because of the whole app store ecosystem. Yeah. How does it work in PWA world? So if somebody goes out and develops their own uh, progressive web app, how is the marketing done or how is the adoption done because you're bypassing the whole huge ecosystem, right? Of the app store. So, yeah. yeah, so there's a couple ways to think about it. First, um, both Google and Microsoft actually make PWAs available in their stores now. Yeah. So you can submit those. It's a different process than going through an approval, but you can submit them and make them available. Apple has not done that yet. Yeah. But what we really recommend is thinking about what we call an activation strategy. Yeah. So thinking about where do people most likely want to activate your app for the first time, mm -hmm. and how do you make it easy for them? So thinking about a great example, right? So Starbucks, yeah. their PWA, if you go to their mobile website, Pinterest does the same thing. Twitter is another example. You're going actually to their PWA, and you yeah. can install it on your home screen yeah. when you're on a mobile device. Other people will do it on signage. So we have a lot of clients where that are more spending, sporting venues and they have big QR codes or text. So when you first walk in, you can get it. We also have other clients that use it with email, email clicks right. or display ads. So I, my, my favorite PWA is Spotify. Yeah. Right? Spotify is a great example of a beautiful PWA, right? So what do you think they're doing right? 
I think part of it is around the user experience, right? right? right. So a couple of things that I think people can make mistakes when they first do it is trying to just create a PWA that's exactly like their native mobile app. Because right. what we've done over the last 10 years is we've bloated native mobile apps. We've stuck everything in them and we haven't really thought about the user experience. Right. So I think Spotify's done a really nice job with that. And then the other thing is you can build bad PWAs and you can make them really heavy mm -hmm. from a code perspective that they don't load fast. Yeah. And Spotify is, loads really fast, has yeah. really great Google Lighthouse scores. Yeah. So I think a lot of it has been kind of based around that. Nice. nice. So are we seeing a trend where we have three systems? We have the old traditional websites, yeah. then we have an app, and we have PWA. Is that the strategy that marketers will need to adopt as they look in? As they look forward? Yeah. What I would really actually caution people on doing is thinking about what makes the most sense for their users. Okay. So you can do all three, but why would you when PWAs can actually do the functionality of the first two? Okay. So if you think about a progressive web app, it can have that native app-like functionality, but it also can work on desktop. Right. And what a lot of people don't know is they're actually installable to the desktop as well, so you can install them and they can yeah. look and feel like an app on your laptop. Right, nice. So Stephanie, moving tracks right yeah. now, I know you're the VP of marketing and you've had some other gigs in the past, including Salesforce and Ingersoll Rand. How different it is, number one, in a SaaS startup mode company to run marketing? Yeah, so one of the things I think is most different from a startup marketing to maybe a more established brand is really like the scrappiness yeah. and your ability to move fast. So you have limited resources, and so what I'm always challenging my team on, and we do this, we call it Project Accelerate, which yeah. is come up with one or two ideas that we can test a week. Something really small and little that we can test, see if it works, and then if it does, let's scale it. Right. Instead of having like these big planning strategic sessions where we think about how we're going to implement something and six months later we do it. Startups don't work like that. Yeah. We have an idea and then sometimes like 48 hours later it's live. Right, right. Yeah, if you wait for six months you might not. It's no longer a good idea a lot of yeah, times. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing is this idea of, I was talking to the chief experience officer at TGI Fridays a couple weeks ago and he likes to say like, what's next? Yeah. How do I be first to market? And I think it's a really great concept yeah. for marketers to think about. By the time you adopt something, if you're not an, if you're not an innovator, everyone, all your competitors have already done it. Right, so you're not right, going to stand right, out. Right. So when you build your marketing yeah. function, marketing team, what are the main areas that you look at, like right now when you are at Lumovate? So what are the main building blocks or the functions that you must have? For yeah. Example? So um, my marketing team is really focused of three kind of groups. Yeah. So one, we own all the SDRs. I really am a big believer that SDRs should report up through marketing. And then we also have demand gen yeah. and content marketing. And they really work hand in hand yeah. Yeah. Um, because I really believe content marketing is not what it used to be. Yeah. It really needs to be part of a cohesive strategy throughout yeah. your campaigns and through ABM. And then um, our other one is really creative. Yeah. So one of the things that a lot of startups don't always invest in is having a really strong creative team member or partnership with an agency. Right. So we have someone that does videos for us, um, all, of, all of our design work, all of our web design, but what's important about that is we're a small team of seven and the marketing team, but we're publishing one to two videos a week. We have you know, uh, one podcast that we do a week right now. We're moving to two episodes starting yeah. next month. We're actually cranking out a lot of video content and a lot of design content that a lot of people wouldn't believe is possible with such a small team. So you work in a hybrid model where you have some folks internally who do the core things of yeah. content, but then you have the other agency who's helping. That help us. That, yeah. And I think one of the things that people need to realize about agencies with startups is they have a different perspective. Yeah and they can actually bring a lot to you a lot faster. Yeah. And so like for instance, we did all of our web design in-house of what yeah. the website would look like, but then we partnered with an agency to do all the actual development. Right. And so we would, we would work to them on like, here's what we're thinking from a design perspective, and then we would have like those trade-off conversations. Um, and we've also done it before where we've had an agency do all of our web work for right. us, or do, you know, we have really great partners that do a lot of our direct mail yeah. and um, fulfillment for that as well. Nice, nice. So as you see marketers in a SaaS company, yeah. what are some of the big three challenges? Not just what you're facing, but overall, you know, so. I think one of them, really that's the biggest to me, is this constant battle between standing out and then doing what everyone else is doing. Yeah. So I can't tell you how many times I talk to colleagues and they say, oh, someone said you're doing this well, tell me what you're doing. And, I'm like, and I, my response is, 
here's what I'm doing, I'm happy yeah. to share, but that doesn't mean it will work for you. Yeah. Don't assume what someone else is doing will work. What you have to figure out is how do you take what other people are doing that is working and yeah. how do you make that work for you or determine it won't work for you. Right. Right. So thinking about innovation and really driving what works for your brand and knowing that it's not an apples to apples comparison, right. even if we sell to the same target, our target market, it's gonna be different. I think the next one is around technology. Right. Um, one of my least favorite things in the entire world is the LinkedIn posts that show me your tech stack. Um, <laughs> because like, I, as software vendors love it because it probably gets them a ton of leads if there's shares on it. But what it doesn't do is it creates this assumption that if you implement this tech stack, you'll have the same results as me. Right. And you won't. Yeah. It doesn't include things like the strategy behind it, the people needed to actually right. do it. They don't tell you like, oh, I use this vendor for X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And these, like I actually need two people to run it. Right. And it was this type of investment. And you have a lot of marketers, especially if they're not really familiar with MarTech solutions, yeah. going out and buying solutions they're not ready for or they don't have the resources to yeah. support. Um, so that's probably like one of my things that challenges that people need to think about. Technology isn't always the answer. Right. Technology, people, and strategy is the answer. Have all three of them come together. So don't always buy the technology before you have the strategy, which I yeah. think a lot of us are don't, don't guilty. Don't go for bells and whistles and see what works for Exactly. You. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I think the third one is really around changing the dynamic of what's expected from marketing. Right. We've really lived in this, you know, how many leads are you giving me per week? I know we joke with sales, like, what have you done for me yeah. lately? But it's yeah. the same in marketing. What have you done for me lately? How many leads? What's your lead score look like? How many of those are getting qualified and passed over to sales? And I think that's all still important and things we should measure. But the same token, there is a much different conversation around brand that needs to happen. Right. And that's harder to manage. Mm -hmm. and it's harder to measure. So I think really figuring out how do you get more of your senior leadership team, like right. your CEO, to understand, yes, I'm still driving leads, but I'm also focused on building this brand because now people are coming to us, and yeah. that's not tomorrow, that's right. six months from now, a year from now, right. but you need me to do that in addition to the demand gen lead stuff, or we're gonna get eaten by our competitors right. 18 months from right. now. Right. right, that's great, that's great, that's great insights, and I think I agree on the technology part too. One last question is about yeah. ABM. I, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm, talk a lot about ABM, we work with a lot about ABM, but what are some of the mistakes rather that you have seen people do when implementing? Because it's everyone's favorite child right now, it you know? Is. So your thoughts on it, you know? Yeah, it's one of my favorite topics um, as well because we do a ton of ABM at Limivate and I have a lot of conversations with other marketing leaders on it. I think my biggest one is probably about two or three years ago, when ABM really started like becoming a buzzword, and I joke about it, it was a buzzword, but like good marketers have actually really been doing it for a while before yeah. it had a name, yeah. so it's not new. Um, but when it started becoming a buzzword, a lot of technology solutions started popping up yeah. to help solve the ABM problem, and a lot of marketers bought them and yeah. didn't really understand what, they thought it would like do ABM for them, I'm like, it does, but, but no, it does like a portion of it, there's still a ton of other work. Right. So I think one, not jumping to technology. I think really sitting down and saying, what am I trying to accomplish with my right. ABM strategy? So for us, we run ABM campaigns. And so we'll go after a specific industry and we have, we've done a ton of research on what's happening in the industry. So we have these like quick industry research docs mm -hmm. that explain like, what are the hottest digital topics? Right. What are some of the use cases they might use our platform for? And then we do research on people. And so while we might be going after an account, we're also going after Bob as a person. Right. So what do we right. know about you? What do we? And that's how we reach out to right. you. It's not that, yes, we want to meet with you because of who you work for, right. Right. but we're trying to connect with you on a personal level. Right. And so we do a lot of things like personalized video. Hmm. Um, we do a lot of personal direct mail. But everything you get from Lumivate is going to be highly personalized, which people say isn't scalable. Yeah. But it is yeah. if you do it the right way. And I think a lot of what we've done is start small, start with an idea, like personalized video. When yeah. I brought that to my team about 18 months ago, of wanting to do a personalized video for every single person we reach out to prospecting wise, they all thought I was crazy. Right. Like how would we do this? And so we just hacked our way into it. So we started with 20 people, we did them old school, like recorded them off a webcam, posted them private on YouTube, yeah. sent them out on a Friday afternoon, which is probably the worst time to send them out. Um, honestly, but by Monday, we had six responses that wanted to meet with us because yeah. they had never seen anything like that. Right. And then that has allowed us to get better at the process, get better at our research, um, to actually speed that up. Yeah. And I think you can get efficiencies after you figure out what works. Right. And when people see what works on your team, they find ways to do it faster. Right. 
Right. So, and I think the whole, a whole temptation of trying to close the lead should not be there as opposed to building a building, relationship. Exactly, right? building a relationship. Um, we have times where we might reach out to someone, like this is a great example, we reached out to them, ran a campaign last fall, and they weren't ready for us. Yeah. And so we reached out again as part of kind of like a follow-up campaign yeah. a couple weeks ago, and literally off the first outreach, we got like four people responded right away which is un, like not normal for your first outreach right, usually. Right. And they're like, yeah, let's set up a time to talk. Like, I know we weren't ready then, but we're ready now, or that we've, you've given us a lot to think about. And they, were, they remember who reached out to them. They, don't, right. they remember Lumivate, but they also remember that it was Greg, right. or that it was Emily. Right. And right. I think that's the big difference in, with, in doing ABM right than just doing general outbound right. prospecting. Right. This is great, Stephanie. Thank you so You're much welcome. for your time. We learned a lot. I'm sure you folks learned a lot too. But thank you for your time. You're great welcome. chatting with great you. Great chatting thank with you. you as well.